My name is uh, Dennis Gove. Uh, I'm presenting with uh, Joel Bernstein. We're going to be talking about the evolution of streaming expressions, uh, kind of the interesting things that we've added this year to it and where we kind of see people using it uh, going forward. Um, our agenda today is first we're going to give a brief overview of solar streams and expressions if you're not familiar with them. We're going to talk about stream evaluators, which were added in uh, 2017. And then Joel's going to jump into statistical programming and the interesting things you can do using the evaluators to do uh, statistical evaluation within solar. So <clears throat> the definition of solar streams and expression, uh, this is from the uh, reference guide. Uh, streaming expressions, they provide a simple, powerful stream processing language for solar. They're just a suite of functions that are combined to perform many different parallel computing tasks. It's kind of a wordy definition. Uh, the way I really think about them is a solar stream is just a pipeline of actions that you perform over a set of tuples. And tuples are just documents coming out of your solar collection. All right. A streaming expression is just a way to describe that pipeline. There's nothing uh, magical about it. It's just the functions that we use to describe what the pipeline looks like. So in this example, uh, we have uh, a simple uh, expression, just a random search across a collection called bookings. And what we're doing is executing a search uh, on that collection uh, for records with uh, city in city A. And we're just asking for 1,000 random records from that search result. We're not asking for all of them, just 1,000 random uh, records. This is slightly different from like the search expression, which would give you all the results back. This one is just 1,000 random records. I don't care which 1,000 they are. We can then wrap that in a sort expression if we wanted to sort those uh, records back into um, uh, sort them by the, the rate of um, their uh, booking, like their hotel booking rate, like if you, if you were to book a hotel, a hotel room, what rate did you pay? So we want to sort them by that rate, so lowest to highest. And now we have a sorted list of those uh, hotel bookings uh, coming out. And it's just a, a stream of tuples just coming out of your, your uh, collection that you can then process later on in your, in your uh, pipeline. Streaming expressions uh, allow you to just kind of wrap uh, these pipelines together so you can put functions within functions. So you can see here what we have is just two uh, sorted uh, random searches against the bookings collection. The first one getting bookings out of city A. The second one getting bookings out of city B. And we're just getting 1,000 from each of those. And then we're going to merge those together. So we're going to end up with 2,000 uh, total records a thousand of them from one city and a thousand of them from the other city, we can then use that, those 2,000 records for whatever else we might want to do uh, later on in our pipeline, okay? So that's kind of the overview of what streaming expressions, uh, uh, what was possible in streaming expressions in Solar 6. The basic syntax of it gave us sort of nested functions and functions that return streams of tuples. Uh, and there, there was a lot of things that you could do with those uh, that previously you couldn't do in solar. You could iterate over individual documents and process them in interesting ways. The most powerful thing that you could really do is merge and join documents from different data sources. So from like two different collections or from a solar collection and a database, you could merge those records together and you could do it in sort of a stream processing way so that you weren't, uh, you weren't having to eat up all of your memory in order to process these records. You can then uh, roll up and collapse those documents um, to like, get like aggregations and counts and things like that. And that's all fine, but there are a lot of things we couldn't do with that. Uh, we weren't able to calculate any new values out of those documents. So if you wanted to like add two values together, or if you had a, a timestamp, you weren't able to say, like, oh, this is like the Monday or Tuesday or things like that. You weren't able to conditionally choose values from a document. So um, you weren't able to say, like, if the value is A, I want to you know, set it to 1. Or if the value is B, I want to set it to 2. You weren't able to do that. And then really the biggest thing is we weren't able to make runtime decisions based on a document's value. So let's say you have a document of type A. You weren't able to say, process it in this way 
versus process it in this other way. Every document was going through the same processing pipeline, and there was no way for you to conditionally choose which, which uh, pipeline to send it to. So what we added this year uh, is stream evaluators. And what they allow you to do is calculate new values from other values in the document. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, stream evaluators are just functions, just like other stream expressions. And within them, you can contain field names, raw values, or other evaluators. So you can have evaluators that evaluate on other evaluators. And here are a couple of examples of them. The first one is just a basic addition. So what we're doing is we're within a tuple, we're taking the value of field A, adding it to the value of field B, and then adding it to 10. And then that's just the result of that evaluator. Second one is a conditional. So if the value of field B is zero, then we're gonna return null. Otherwise, we're going to return a, the value of field A divided by the value of field B. So you can see how we're conditionally choosing whether or not we wanna do a division or we wanna protect ourselves from a divide by zero error. And the third one is just a basic coalesce where we're choosing the first non-null value out of a, a list of uh, fields in the tuple. So if you have like default values that you might wanna fall back to, <coughs> excuse me, you could put that in the coalesce and you say, choose the value of field A or field B or field C or this default value if they're all null, all right? So where can we use stream evaluators in the stream uh, pipeline? There are a couple of places we can use them. The first one is in the select statement uh, when you wanna add new values to a document. So in this example, let's imagine we have a collection that is um, storing equities of, uh, storing equities, and for each document you have the closing price for that equity throughout the year. So in this example, we're looking at Google in 2017, and these are the closing prices for seven of those days. Imagine we have 365 of those in a multi-valued uh, field. What we can do, uh, <coughs> excuse me, what we can do is calculate the moving average of that, of uh, those closing prices over a five day period, right? And we can give it any period we want. So we could do a five day period, a three day period, a 20 day period, whatever it is. And we can calculate the moving average across the actual closing values. And what this will do is transform the tuple into one that has the original ID, the year, and then a five day average field. So the first value in the resulting uh, multi-valued array will be the uh, average of the first five values in the original uh, multi-valued set, <clears throat> and then the next value will be the next five values and the average of those, and so on and so forth until you get all the way to the end. And this kind of transforms the tuple before you might want to process it later on and do something else interesting with, with your tuple. Another place in streaming where you might want to use these is in the let expression. I won't get into too much detail about what the, the let uh, expression allows you to do. Joel will talk a little bit more about that. But basically, it allows you to store variables within your pipeline that you can use later on in your processing. So in this example, what we're doing is taking the sorted random set of bookings that we were looking at before and storing that in an array called city A. And in that array, we just have an array of the tuples. So you have the tuple with the field name rate and the rate that was paid uh, in that row, okay? We're then going to use that variable inside of the evaluator called column, the COL evaluator. And within that, what we're going to say is, please give us the value of the rate field and put that in its own array that we're gonna store in a variable inside of our, our stream. What we can then uh, do with that is any kind of like array math that we might wanna do on this or any kind of statistical programming over arrays on this data. And Joel uh, is gonna talk about what um, we can do with the statistical programming using these evaluators uh, going forward and um, sort of why uh, the evaluators give us a lot more power inside of solar. Thanks, Dennis. Okay, um, so my section is more specific uh, and it's 
specifically around statistical programming, uh, but it does, you know, build on a lot of the stuff that Dennis already um, kind of talked about. Um, quick introduction about myself, and you know, I'm, uh, my name is Joel Bernstein. Um, I'm a Lucene Solar Committer and PMC member. Um, I'm a search engineer at a company called Alfresco, um, and I used to work for a company called Helio Search and LucidWorks, um, and I live and work uh, in New York City. Um, a little bit about Alfresco software. So uh, Alfresco does enterprise content management and business process management. Uh, we've got 1,300 um, enterprise customers, and uh, we're a big consumer of solar. We have a customized version of solar, which we ship with Alfresco. And um, we are now starting to roll out all kinds of exciting features. So some of the things we're talking about today are going to be in Alfresco soon. So um, why statistics? And you know, this is something that you know, I've been asked a number of times. Um, and so statistics are you know, they're a natural extension of what solar are, is already doing. So solar is able to uh, search and bring back result sets, basically segment data. Um, it's able to do very fast uh, time series. Uh, it's able to do really, really you know, fast uh, random sampling, and it's able to do SQL. And with statist uh, the statistics, we can now um, do analysis on top of those result sets. So basically, it's just the next step you know, for solar. So you really can't you know, go much further without mentioning Apache Commons math. So everything, all the statistical, program, um, all the st statistical functions are backed by Apache Commons math here. So I wouldn't have gotten very far without you know, that project. So a quick thank you if you guys are listening somewhere. You know, thanks for all the work. Um, we're putting it to good use. So essentially what we did is we took Apache Commons math and we wrapped it up in a functional programming language. And that functional programming language is streaming expressions. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the language because actually we put a lot of thought into how it works. So in streaming expressions, everything is a function. You can't make a move without making it a function. Um, even data structures are functions, and that allows you to put data structures in places where you would put a function. So basically, functions and data are interchangeable. Um, so all functions take parameters, and all functions evaluate a result. There is no such thing as a void return type in this. So, and, and basically, that's part of the no side effects business. So in functional programming, side effects mean that you can't Basically, you can't, if you have no side effects, you can't change a variable that exists in memory elsewhere. So in this case, you know, that's you know, been strictly um, kept. Okay, so this slide is the coverage of statistics that we started with in 7.0 and 7.1. And don't get too worried because we're not going to go through this in this presentation. I put it up mostly just so people can get a feel for what's here. Those who know statistics um, will know these things. Those who don't, don't worry because you know, it's in solar now so you can, you can learn it. Um, and it's pretty easy to learn. But what we're gonna go through is really, really straightforward examples um, building up pieces of this till we get to a, um, a more complete example. So as our first example, actually Dennis already saw, showed in one place, it's just a simple addition. And notice that it's a function. Um, and notice that it is Returning a JSON result, that result is coming from the stream handler. So the stream handler no longer needs to return tuples. The stream handler can now just return mathematical results. So basically, it's now just you know, a math engine, essentially, on its own. So each function can be a building block for larger, um, let's just call them like equations. And in this case, we're taking a function and we're nesting it inside of another one. And you can do that you know, as much as you want to build up whatever equations that you need to do. And you can see that the result comes back you know, just the same as the other one. OK, so now we're getting into some more types of functions that this can do. So there's a function called convert. Um, and it does basically it does conversions. In this case, it's converting miles to kilometers and says, uh, give me uh, you know, that with a convert 100 miles to kilometers and gives you the answer of 161. Um, and so there's a small number of conversions now, but eventually there'll be a very large number of conversions because there, you know, there's a large number of conversions that can be done. It does text analysis. Um, so this function takes a block of text and a field name from a solar schema, and it returns the analyzed tokens. And with that, you can actually you know, string together your own analyzers, you know, however you want, and do NLP. Uh, plug in your own analyzers and do NLP. 
So this is basically a hook point for natural language processing within streaming expressions. And you can see it's returning an array of the tokens. Uh, random number generation. So, um, so this is a really powerful random number generator. So you'll notice that the inner function is a normal distribution. So we have a function that's called normal distribution now. And it's taking, um, it basically has a mean of 500 and a standard devi deviation of 40 and it's wrapped in a sample function, and we're taking a sample of that distribution. So we're returning a sample that matches that distribution. And um, well, there's lots of other distributions we can do. And so we can, be, you know, we can use a uniform distribution and be perfectly you know, um, random, or we can choose you know, any of our other distributions that are available in the, in the language. And this is interesting for a number of reasons, because you know, there are a lot of mathematical use cases that need data in certain distributions, or at least let's call it statistical use cases that would need it. And the other thing is that this is a building block for simulations. So if you need to simulate you know, what could happen um, if you were to have a certain distribution. Uh, we could have factorials. So factorials are useful because they uh, allow you to do combinations and permutations. And in statistics and probability, that's a useful thing to be able to do. We can do prime numbers. So you can say, you know, give me all, give me prime numbers. So this say, give me 10 prime numbers greater than 2,500. And it will just spit them back out for you. You can do probability. So in this case, we have a different distribution called a Poisson distribution. Uh, it has a mean of 20. And what we're saying is, what is the probability of 16 coming in that distribution? And it gives you an answer. So, you know, these are the types of things that, um, you know, if you're interested, if you have a probability distribution and you're trying to predict what would happen, you know, this is, you know, one of the ways of doing it. Okay, I'm gonna continue on. This is our first data structure, and notice it's a function, and the function is array, and it returns an array of numbers. And um, it's, you know, the first building block of vector math. And then we have matrices. So this is an, a nested set of arrays. Um, and notice that it returns it the way you would expect it to. And this is the building block of a lot of machine learning um, things, so a lot of matrix math stuff. And we can do array transformations. So in this case, we're taking an array, and we are log, doing a log transform on the array, which is something that you would do quite, frequent, quite frequently, actually, in statistics to bring down or bring back in the, um, the outliers. Uh, we're getting to some statistics. Um, so here, we're taking two arrays, and we're wrapping a correlation function around it, and we're returning the correlation to it. Uh, we can do vector math. So vector math is also the basics of um, you know, statistics and machine learning. In this case, we're taking the dot product of two arrays, um, and you know, there's a lot of vector math in the system. There's also a lot more statistical functions than I've shown. Plotting, so this is a lot of fun. So, uh, there is a, um, another project called Sunplot, which was written by uh, someone on my team uh, at Alfresco named Michael Suzuki. And Sunplot allows you, it basically what it does is it responds to streaming expressions and plots. So there's a plot function. And in this case, the function is taking a, a type of line. And it has a y-axis, which is pointing to a function which is creating a sine wave. And the way it's doing is that the inner function is creating a sequence of a certain, you know, I, I could say what it does, but it's not worth explaining, but it's creating a sequence and then it's wrapping that in a sine function, which is transforming that sequence into a sine wave. And we're able to plot that. And that's actually kind of interesting because there are a lot of statistical functions that work on sine waves. So here you can create your own, run the functions on them and test them and see how they work. Here's an example of a scatter plot. And in this case, what we're doing is we're taking a normal distribution, the same one we had last time, and we're taking a random sample of it, and we're using it as the y-axis. So you can just see you know, what a, what a um, normal distribution looks like in a scatter plot. Okay, we're back to the let example. So in this example, we're taking um, variables a and b, um, and the first one is just you know, the addition. And in the second one, the, the scale function, we're using that variable, and then we're returning what is the variable b. And if you notice about this, the way that let works is it returns the last variable that you uh, evaluate. So if you do 10 variables in a row, the last one pops out. Okay, so you can write a program just doing this, just with you know, basically you know, setting variables, moving it down, going all the way down the line, and all of a sudden out comes your answer. 
if you set echo equal to true in let, it actually echoes all the variables. So you can see the steps in your program print out. You can see how the different numbers change. Okay, so up until this point, all we've been doing is using um, solar as a pure math engine. We haven't connected it to any data, but we can. We can connect it to our data in the index um, or anywhere in our cluster. And um, one of the useful things that we can do is we can work with time series. So before we connect it, I'm gonna first show a time series expression, what it looks like. And it looks like what you see on the screen. And basically what this is doing is it's going to collection one and it's getting back um, a query, pulling back documents with ticker symbol ABC. And it's aggregating uh, the field T date, which is a time field. And then you give it a start and an end and a gap and a format, and it gives you a time series out of that. So it's a real-time aggregation. It's using the JSON Facet API under the covers. And who's, if people are familiar with um, time series work in solar, it's similar, the, the, the syntax is similar, it's just wrapped up in a function. And if you look at the result, we have tuples. So we get the T date, which is our formatted date you know, uh, range or, or gap, and then we get the aggregation, in this case, average price I. So once we have a time series, we have a natural vector because each, um, each value each of the average price I is actually can be considered a point in the vector that we can work with statistically. So let's see how we might do that. So this is similar to the example that Dennis gave earlier. So we're gonna do a time series, but first, be before we actually do anything uh, more with it, we're gonna uh, use the column function to take the average price field out of the time series and put it into a vector. Okay, so now you can see that the vector of prices is there. And you know, the nice thing you know, you know, about this is that you know, it's you know, gonna be very fast. So if you have a really large amount of data, you can get your time series back really quickly, get it into a vector like that, and you're ready to operate on it. And this is our kind of our final example. Um, of putting it all together and doing some statistics on top of our data from solar. So here we're taking variables A and B and we're doing two time series with a different ticker. So we're taking two stock prices basically, two different stocks. And we're, we're generating a time series for the same, say the same uh, date range, even though it's abbreviated, but we can assume that here. Um, and then we're taking both of those and we are moving um, we're creating two vectors out of that, so we have now two vectors in memory, uh, and that's C and D, and then we're gonna regress them. So this is gonna do a simple regression, and for people who aren't familiar with simple regression, what we're looking for here is the relationship between ticker A, B, C, and ticker e, D, E, F, and we wanna see is there a linear relationship. So if ticker A, B, C goes up, what happens to ticker D, E, F, which can be a very useful thing in a lot of different fields. And so when we regress it, it returns something interesting. It returns a mathematical model. So not only do we return, we don't have to just return numbers or arrays, we can return mathematical models. And that mathematical model describes the regression between the two. And that's variable R. And then variable P, we're taking that regression uh, that model, and we're gonna make a prediction using that model. So there's the predict function, and it takes as its parameter a regression that was done, and then a value that we're gonna predict against. And in this case, what we're doing is we're predicting, we're saying, if the value of ticker ABC is 310, what would the value of DEF be? And the answer is 209. Now, this is a really simple example of actually a fairly complex thing, because you wouldn't just do this. You would first, look at the output of the regression, see if the relationship was actually valid, if there really was a relationship before you started predicting things. So, um, and there's also a lot of rigor that you can apply. One of the things about the library that we have now is that I tried to make sure that there were enough functions present that you could actually do this with rigor. So actually, if you are a real statistician and we're doing these types of things, you could actually have enough functions to work with to do it properly. So, um, we go back to that, I don't have it back on the screen, but if you go back to that major set of all those things that are in here, that's what that's all there for, is to do these types of things with rigor. 
So, and there's a lot more coming. So Apache, we are barely scratched the surface of Apache Commons math, and there are other libraries that will be uh, integrating as well. I'm done, so let's take the questions. Yep. Thanks. I don't know how much time we have. I think we got plenty of time, don't we? Yeah. Uh, I was more inspired by SAS and R. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think you know, there are definitely similarities. It behaves differently than Spark. Yes, so, yes, so when I said there are no side effects, that was actually what that means, okay, yeah. The language is, is, um, is different, so streaming expressions is much more, it's much more closely modeled after Lisp than, yeah. Okay, so let's talk about exactly how that works with this. So there are pieces of this that are done in parallel. So the aggregations are done in parallel. The random sampling are done in parallel. What comes back from, aggregation, from aggregations or random sampling is typically small enough to fit in memory. So that's one of the big differences between the thinking behind this and Spark. So the, 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 particularly the random sampling piece. So the idea is, is that we are going to be really good at random sampling. We're gonna be very fast. We can build, bring back fairly large random samples. Like, you know, you can bring back a random sample of like 20,000 records in less than a second, get it into an array and process it. And that is kind of our, let's just call it our secret sauce. And those random samples we're gonna to use to estimate statistics for the larger set. And um, so it's a different mindset than Spark where then everything is distributed across, all computations distributed. Once we bring it back, we do it in one spot. Okay, yeah. I think though Spark has spent a lot more time thinking about distributed computation. Yeah. Yes. Yes, that's the, that's the main thing. And also time series. Sorry for not picking you earlier. Yeah. Yes, so it's totally pluggable. So, uh, let's also talk about that because that's actually really interesting. So the only thing that you can do in streaming expressions is run a function. You can't actually write a function in streaming expressions. So, um, and that's by really in many ways, one, it's easier for us to, to manage, but also it's by design because uh, functional programming, at least in my opinion, it's easier to do small things than to try to do complex big things in functional programming. So the functions are written in Java. So you, you write a function in Java, you map it to it, and you run it in, and as long as you follow the, um, the API, your functions will just you know, work with everything else. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> you know, one of, the, one of the nice things about this, I think, is that it's just, you know, it's uh, under the covers, it's pure Java. So, um, you know, so Dennis does a lot of functional programming inside Java, but that's his decision. Um, if you didn't want to, you could just write pure, you know, object-oriented programming under the covers, um, or you can do functional stuff uh, in Java, but um, maybe, you know, you could find a way to rig up some Scala into there, but it's not designed for it. It could, it could, it could. So it kind of is, so you're talking about a function query, like a solar function query. Oh, that's actually interesting, because Trey Granger asked me that the other day, or just, yes, it was yesterday. So 
what he asked was, is there any way that we could link this into the other parts of solar? And the answer is right now there's nothing, there's no hooks right now to do it. But there's nothing to stop you from writing a function query that did this. So, but, so function queries typically work with you know, one document at a time, and they were originally designed to help out a lot with ranking. And so this is kind of a different animal, sort of, which works with large result sets, you know, boils them down, it's great. And, So there are, so there was a piece of the pipeline when I said there was a let statement and there were multiple variables and if you said echo, you could see each piece of it. I think that's the closest thing we'd have to a pipeline. So you can build it up slowly. So you can say, okay, first let me do the time series, see what it looks like. Put that to a variable, move on to the next piece. And then if you do the echo, you can see all the pieces come out. So there is a function called update, which will actually store it in another collection, but it's not gonna store the really complex, so let's say the statistical stuff is really um, flexible as far as what it can return. So it can return anything. You could you know, have it return you know, and levels deep and everything like that, and that work with the update function. So the answer is if you do something very simple, you can. If you do something complex, you can't. So the, so the time series stuff is as fast as the JSON API is. Moving it into arrays is really quick. Um, and operating, like doing operations on top of those arrays is just, just nothing. So the real amount of time that it takes right now until we start doing more complex things with it is the amount of time it takes to do the aggregation. So, and the random sample. So with the random sample, you're gonna return most likely larger result sets than um, an aggregation. But the random samples still come back fairly quickly. <laughs> so this, the question about billion results is interesting. So often in statistics, you would take a, a subpopulation of the billion results and compare it to another subpopulation. The use case where you just say, you know, give me everything, I, I don't know, if, maybe there are use cases where it happens, but often you're comparing things. So you could take a random sample from a billion results and um, Depending on the distribution of those results, you know, you could possibly get, you know, a good sample that was not that was not too large that re would represent the whole thing. Um, but uh, I think a, a lot of what solar's real strength is going to be is going to be separating, you know, picking out subpopulations, comparing them, you know, things like that. Yeah. So, so uh, I think you mentioned the sun plot, right? The sun yeah. Plot. Yeah. So Sunplot was, came about um, because uh, my coworker Michael wanted to contribute to uh, the, the, the project to solar, but we didn't have uh, really great ways of getting stuff into our uh, admin. So he went off and did another project. And so the question is, you know, do we continue developing Sunplot all the way out uh, and have that kind of be a separate project or do we bring it in? Uh, right now it's usable, you know, kind of as is. Um, but there's a lot more that we can do. And I think the, the way that I kind of would like it to do is that it works you know, very closely with streaming expressions so that you would actually, it would very minimal UI, and when you want it to do something, you actually type a function. So that it is just tied in completely with streaming expressions would be the eventual goal if we take it that far. But, but like, are you going to stick to only some plot or like? Oh, the thing is, is that, so, there's, we could talk a little bit about SQL's role in this, and so SQL will open up some things, but so I think the idea being in the beginning, so that the streaming expressions themselves are just a, you know, a request response, it's a string. Other things could handle it. Uh, it's not clear that other things could maybe handle the result because the result is complicated sometimes. So um, like it could be, a very complicated plot, a more complicated plot than say something like Zeppelin could do. So I, I'm not sure if, um, you know, I think you know, we wanna be able to do things like you know, 
do a scatter plot, um, and then put a line through the middle of the scatter plot for like a regression or something like that. So, you know, when you think of something like R Studio, R Studio is very tied to R and how it works. I could see this going in that direction. So the way that it works is that it, um, it takes a, a random uh, seed and it hashes that seed against each doc ID in the result and then uses that as the sort criteria so that basically what you're getting is a random sort that comes back. And it's as good as that hash is. And I had a you know, quick talk with Yannick about that because I think Yannick did the original work on that hash and there may be ways that we can make that better, faster, more random. Say that again? Is it possible to create multiple buckets for random data? Yeah, so, well, multiple buckets. So what you can do, you saw where I had two time series. You could do as many random samples as you want, send them the variables and process them. So, and that's a very typical case would be to take multiple random samples and then do something like a k-nearest neighbor of them, see which one is nearest to the other or something like that. Oh, every time you run it, it's different. So um, right now, there isn't a way to save a seed so the seed is generated each time. So have you tried on some kind of scaling, like you know, tried it to kind of really scale pretty large? And so I did not put this in anything larger than like 20 million documents, but it's just gonna scale as large as, you know, so what we're talking about here is how fast can it do you know, random sampling across a collection and how fast can it do, you know, a JSON fast API across. So we know those scale fairly well. Um, just from you know past you know work experience, so and we know that we're bringing it back into one memory space, so we know that we're not going to bring back you know too much data, but we do know that we can bring back fairly large sets and work with them. So I don't, I wouldn't say that we've you know you know done anything definitive, but I think it's going to fail. It's, it's going to scale fairly well. It'll probably handle lots of use cases. Let's put it that way. It may not handle the biggest use cases, but lots will handle lots of use cases. So there's only a, so the only complex number function that I looked at was the Fourier transform, and um, so we're going to add Fourier transform really soon. Now, whether or not we present the complex numbers is a different question, though. Are you any good with those, by the way? <laughs> All right, so yeah, we, we should talk. Uh, what's that? Hum? Yeah, well, the Fourier transform is actually kind of important um, nowadays, and so um, it's kind of taken on a whole like uh, you know, important piece of, uh, of of math. So they're going to get in, um, and they're actually they're there. They're in Apache Commons math. Uh, the bigger question with them is what to do with it once we've transformed the data. So uh, how to apply filters to it, um, how to use the complex number in a Fourier transform, things like that. Yeah. 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 Oh, there might be, but the Fourier transform is um, so it's a big part of uh, convolution and convolution. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And then you can filter it, and so. Yeah, and so I've already played around with it. It's just a matter of you know getting it in, basically. Right. If you guys are interested, you know, work with me on it. You know, I'm I'm very interested in it, by the way. That's my. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe maybe you won't next time. Anybody else? Anybody else? Talk about the Fourier transform. I was actually trying to get Dot to work on the Fourier transform for me the other day. <laughs> Okay, that's it. Thanks.